All right, gentlemen, if you're listening to this show within a few days of when it dropped, you still have time to get in on this month's masterclass, which is for mature audiences only. Now, listen, if you're a grown ass man, what you're encountering when dating and relating to women is far different nowadays compared to what frat boys and the cast of MTV's real world have dealt with. Although we're definitely going to reveal new and powerful secrets to dating younger women, this masterclass will finally go way beyond that. Get the list of everything that's included at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash masterclass. And I'll see you there on Wednesday night, August 31st. Live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters, you're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Greetings, gentlemen. Welcome again to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. As always, I am your host, Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter, Truth Social, TikTok, and Clubhouse. And by the way, I just put some new stuff up there on TikTok, so uh, check it out. And at Real Scott McKay on Instagram, of course. The website is mountaintoppodcast.com. All the YouTube goodies are there for you on YouTube by searching my name, S-C-O-T-M-C-K-A-Y. And guys, if you have not joined the Facebook group yet, listen, man, you're missing out. I keep telling you this. Go join our group of guys on Facebook at the Mountaintop Summit who are getting better with women and having a whole lot of fun doing so. Now, speaking of a whole lot of fun, what's more fun than going to a party? Well, my guest today is a new friend of mine. He's a first-time guest. He hails from Austin, Texas, which is just up the highway from here, of course, I-35 to be more specific. He's an author and an entrepreneur. His book is getting great reviews, and many of them on Amazon right now. It's called The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Big Relationships with Small Gatherings. And today, we're going to talk about a variety of different topics, actually, including how to be more outgoing, how to be the life of the party, how to build your social circle, and especially how to do all of that if it doesn't particularly come natural to us. So, without anything further, Nick Gray from Austin, Texas. Welcome, man. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Greetings. Yeah, man. Now, listen, let's just call this out straight up. If Tim Ferriss says we need a four-hour work week, then, man, at the very least, we deserve a two-hour cocktail party. Now, don't we? You're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's efficient. <laughs> it is efficient. Right. So I know from talking to you briefly that a two-hour cocktail party, I don't know, it's a little deeper than what it seems on the surface, isn't it? So tell us a little bit more about the concept, Nick. Imagine what your life would be like if you were a social connector, if you could meet people and have new relationships just come to you. How would your life be different if you were the center of attention? And that is what I got. Those are the benefits I received when I started to host parties. Instead of going to crappy networking events, I decided to bring the party to me. And I've hosted hundreds of parties and I wrote a book. And I'm happy to share with you everything that I've learned along the way. Now, you know what? There's an amazing life-changing insight in there, and I want to spell it out in plain English for these guys. You decided to be proactive about this, and the reason why that's so important in my estimation is because I think a lot of people, when they're thinking about more social popularity, building their social circle, networking, and the like, they do their best to try to get invited to other people's parties. But not you, not this Nick Gray cat. You came around and said, well, I'm going to throw the party myself. I'm going to be the party and I'm going to bring the party to them. And I'll tell you what, Nick, I can relate to that. I can relate to that mindset firsthand, actually. As these guys know, BMX racing has always been a big part of my life. And to this very day, you know, my kids are racing BMX and I'm announcing races and so forth. But when I was a kid racing BMX, Unfortunately, I was not really good enough to be invited to be part of what's called a factory team, but it was on my bucket list to be a factory team writer, you know, with the guys who are in the magazines and whatever. And similarly, as an adult, I started with this particular journey at XMI Communications. You know, it landed on my bucket list to be a published author, right? Well, in both of the cases I just cited, I followed a similar strategy to what you're talking about. 
what I did as an adult was I started a factory level team in the BMX racing world, you know, years ago now, and I rode for it. So I was teammates with all the guys who were in the magazines, but I was pretty much on the team because, well, hey, I started the team. And similarly, when it came to being a published author, I didn't wait for Random House or somebody to come along. I started the freaking publishing company myself. So that proactivity is, well, it's strangely unique. Even nowadays, people wait reactively for something to happen to them, for something to happen for them, instead of going out there and making it happen. So Nick, talk to me a little bit more about what inspired you to bring the party to people, to bring the party to everybody else. So I love that you built your own team. You said, if they won't give me a stage, I will build my own. And it's similar, right? If if I'm not having success at parties, then I'll throw my own. Um, I went to a lot of events where I would walk in and it'd be overwhelming and intimidating. And I just wasn't meeting or connecting with the type of people that I wanted to. So I started to host small house parties for about 15 or 20 of my friends. And this isn't a book just if you have a lot of friends. This was also for me a great way to meet new people because the secret is, you know, everyone wants to know someone who brings people together and you can be that person. You should be that person. All it takes is just to host a party. Yeah. Another interesting point you just brought up is what if I don't like the parties I'm being invited to? And of course, party in this case can be a metaphor for my workplace, the team I'm playing for, if I'm on a softball team or whatever, really anything I'm doing that involves a group of people. If I feel like I'm just along for the ride or really don't fit in here, well then, hey, why not start my own quote unquote party, do my own thing? Because, uh, well, you know, not because I'm a rebel per se, but just because I want to find my own tribe because it's not going to happen by happy accident. I love that idea. And so the cool coincidence there, and I'm not sure if you can really call it a coincidence, it's certainly fortunate, is that when you're talking about actually creating social gatherings around your style of doing that, not only are you the center of the party, but you're also starting to network with the people you invite, the people you want in your life, the people you want to get to know. And you're doing that around an event that's going to be pleasurable and fun for them. So it gives them a good first impression, doesn't it? It gives them a favorable experience. And the next thing you know, like one of my guests said so eloquently recently, your network is your net worth. That's exactly right. I like that. I like that phrase. Your network is your net worth. And that's true. Yeah. Right. It's a really nice way to bring people. And I like what you also said about building your tribe, because the parties are a great way for you to really exhibit your skills as a leader and host a gathering. And I think that art is a soft skill that we don't think about enough. And it's something I'm pretty passionate about. Well, describe this skill to us. The skill of leading a group of people, the skill of welcoming people into your home. By the way, I talk about hosting a party, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I think that your party should be hosted at your home, and I'll tell you why. Number one, because it's generous. There's no bar tab. People aren't paying. And you can do all this, by the way, for under $100. It doesn't cost a lot of money to buy some alcohol and mixers. Number one, it's generous. Number two, you turbocharge your relationships. Inviting someone into your home is like going on a little date with them. And number three is it is incredibly vulnerable. It's incredibly vulnerable to bring someone into your home. And a lot of people that I talk to say, well, my, my house isn't big enough. It's too messy. The reality is, is that nobody's going to show up to your house and be so judgmental that they get so mad and they leave and they start a rival cocktail party that night. That just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen? Like, ever? I mean, it come on, Nick. What if I live in a van down by the river or if I live in my mommy's basement and I really maybe for whatever reason have something to hide there? What if I have crappy roommates who are just antisocial and I'm ashamed of them? What if my dog bites people? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> those are all... Those are all good excuses. Those are all good excuses. I would okay. say 95. <laughs> this show's not for them. <laughs> <laughs> this book, they can still do other things. You know what? They can host a party in a park. They can host a party in a public spot. I worked with a guy in Atlanta, Georgia last week who had exactly that situation. 
he's subletting and he wasn't allowed to have more than six people over to the house at any time. And so we host in the park and it was great. It was still good. Okay. So the optimal scenario is to do this at your place. If that's just not going to happen, you know, there are alternatives that will work. So you're not being yes, draconian I, about this. I'm not being draconian, but I really don't believe in hosting a party at a bar. I call them barties. It's when you get all your friends together at a bar and it's just not, how can I say this? You don't know who's really there for the party. It's a mixed company. It's loud. It's not generous. So I would suggest that's the one do not do. Do not host this at a bar. Well, it's going to cost money to rent the place, right? And some kind of cover fee for the bar to have you hold the party there anyway. There's you know? a cover fee. There's a minimum spend. Your friends have to buy drinks. They have to wait in line. It's a much different attitude and environment that really doesn't put you in a leadership role like it does when you host at home. Yeah, it's kind of like taking your new girlfriend to see your friend's band play, right? She's probably going to find your friend and his band a lot more attractive than you because they're the center of attention. That's all and right. They're on stage doing cool things, and you're kind of just standing there next to her like a fanboy. <laughs> Bad idea. That's that's actually the best analogy that I've ever heard. You're exactly Thank right. Thank you. It doesn't put you in the top spot. Yes. You can Nailed steal it. that for future podcasts you're on. That's really you good. You bring it up and take full credit for it. It's good. I like it. And it's accurate, too. When you host at home, people will see you in your space and you're the natural leader. All right. Now, you said you could do these parties for under a 100 bucks. I'm going to invite people into my home. Let's say I have a pretty cool apartment, a loft, maybe my own home. And I'm going to do this thing. What am I spending that $100 on exactly? What should I buy? And what should I not buy? How should I prepare? And what's unnecessary for me to have to try to think I need to do to prepare? Oh, well, I'll tell you what's unnecessary is people oftentimes buy too much food. Food, trust me, people will not be eating that much food. It's more about the people. It's not about the drinks. It's not about the food. It's about the people. But I'll tell you exactly what to buy. I do want to say that even if you have a tiny home or a tiny apartment, I worked with a guy in Chicago. His apartment was only 350 square feet. The energy was electric because everybody was crowded in there. You can still do this in tiny, tiny apartments. Um, what do you need to buy? Well, you need to buy some sort of alcohol. These days, a lot of people like seltzers, the hard seltzers. Do you drink those at all? Not personally, because I can't tell the difference between those and your garden variety, non-alcoholic bubble water. <laughs> it is similar. I've not tried Happy Dad yet. You know, Elon Musk's buddies out of California who don't believe in the skinny cans. You oh, know? that's cool. The Happy Dad seltzer. I haven't tried that. Nice. I haven't tried that one either. They should be a sponsor on this show now. What I like to do is I like to buy some hard alcohol. So I suggest that folks buy maybe a, a little bit of vodka, some whiskey and tequila, and then some simple basic mixers. I got a controversial opinion here, but you don't need to have beer. I do think you should have a little bit of wine and then you need some non-alcoholic options. So I like regular seltzer for that or waters are great. Maybe some Coke and Diet Coke. So do you kick people out when they get to for Schnicker or what? The surprising thing about this is people actually drink a lot less than you would imagine. The party is set up to be more about mingling and making new friends. So I haven't actually had, in the hundreds of parties that I've hosted, I've maybe had one or two examples where I had to cut somebody off. Except that one hot chick. You load her up so you can get lucky later. <laughs> that could be <laughs> problematic. <I'm kidding. laughs> Absolutely. And the guys who are longtime listeners to this show know for sure I was being facetious. So <laughs> if this is your first rodeo with the show, I was definitely kidding. All right. Now, you said something extremely powerful, Nick, that I'm not sure most people understand. If you have a 350 square foot apartment and you have 20 people in there, it seems like a happening party. I mean, this is hopping. This is the thing to do on that particular night you're throwing it. Now, if you've crammed 20 people into that apartment, that's the way it's going to be. But if you have a 4,000 square foot home and you throw a party and the same 20 people show up, everybody's going to go, well, this is a flop. Nobody's here. You're Yes. You, yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. It actually ruins your party because you had more space for so few people. I mean, anybody who's ever been to a baseball game and the stadium seats, say, 50,000 people and 4,000 fans show up. You know, I'm an Orioles fan, so for years this has been really something I take personally. 
or worse, like there's more Red Sox fans in Camden Yards for a Red Sox game than than there are Oriole fans. Well, I digress, but I'm just starting to feel sorry for myself now, frankly, Nick. But I know from firsthand experience that if you have 50 people coming to something, if it's in a basement with a keg in the middle, it's going to seem like the place to be. But if you try to throw that gig at, say, a full-scale convention venue, people are going to go, well, this was a total failure. It's that illusion of space relative to the people in it that makes a party seem like it's really cool or really lame. It matters psychologically. Yes, and yeah, and you understand that. You can go to the biggest house and the biggest mansion with 25 people, and the energy is just absent. It feels empty. It feels dull. It feels dead. But you go to a basement party, and this is why it's counterintuitive advice that people don't know. If you have a smaller party, a smaller house, the energy is more electric. It feels more alive. Now, similarly, the more people at your party is actually less work for you as a host within reason. I'm not suggesting you have a blowout party with 50 people. But if you have only 10 people who show up, Compare that to about 18 people. It is way less work for you when there's 18 people compared to 10 people. They'll socialize among themselves. They'll socialize among themselves. You don't have to babysit people. There's more new connections. Your guests are excited. 10 people in a room, they look around, they say, okay, I can meet everybody here. 18, it sounds subtle, but it's actually a big difference. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of guys listening to this saying, okay, you two, Nick Gray, Scott McKay. There's an elephant in the room here. I mean, if you have an elephant come to your party, hey, you filled up that space pretty effectively. And um, I think that party is going to pick up as soon as the elephant walks in. You know, unless you're on the second or third floor, then you might have structural issues. But (laughs) the proverbial elephant in the room here for a lot of guys listening, and I'm going to raise my hand too, is what if I'm kind of introverted? What if I'm not a big fan of having a whole lot of people around me at once? Not that I'm completely socially inept, it's just that it's not really my thing, and I don't really feel like I'm all that outgoing either. I know you have a lot to say to guys who don't feel like they're outgoing and or may feel a little introverted. Shyness, of course, is something completely different. I'm going to let you address these guys, Nick, however you want to in terms of any kind of social reticence about potentially throwing a party like this. And I mean, who am I kidding? Social reticence may be a flat-out phobia for some of these guys. What say you? You're exactly right. Someone may be listening to us talk and say, wow, I have anxiety even imagining hosting a party. Just listening to this makes me feel uncomfortable. And I want to let you know that that is normal. And I've worked with a lot of guys to help them host their first party. Here's what helps. Here's what's going to help you. Thinking about the first five people who you would invite. And knowing that the first five people that you would invite would be what I call your core group. What do I mean by core group? I mean, these are your best friends. These are your colleagues that you work closely with. They're not people that you're trying to impress drastically. That's what I suggest. Start with your core group when you begin planning your party. More so uh, as you think about the party, I've planned out every single minute of those two hours to tell you the exact scripts to invite people, what to say when you text message your invites, what to say when the first person arrives, and then how to kick people out at the very end. I've thought through this, and I've written down every single example. I'm happy to go in to any of those that Scott wants me to share. Well, all right, then. Scott would love for you to share a lot of these different things. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions first, though. In terms of shyness, in terms of maybe being introverted, that bit about having your core group of dudes or dudettes who you want to invite because they're the people you feel comfortable around. First question is, should you give any thoughts to co-hosting a party at your place with these people and letting them take some sort of leadership role? Or is that sketchy? I do like the idea of co-hosting, and co-hosting can be such a powerful tool when you don't have a lot of friends. To link up and say, look, I'll invite half people and you invite the other half, it can be a powerful thing. What I would just encourage is to make sure that the expectations of your co-host are lined up. Because, you know, my party is a little bit weird. There's name tags, there's icebreakers, there's email reminders. It's kicked out at the end of two hours. You want to make sure that your co-host sort of knows that you're going to be leading this. But I think that's a great idea to have a co-host. It's 
it's actually genius for people who don't have that many friends. All right. The second question I thought of is harking back to old episodes of David Duchovny on Californication. Did you ever see that TV show? I've heard of it. Okay. It's a great show if you're interested in getting better with women, because David Duchovny's character, Hank Moody, is just legendary in that regard. My wife and I watched every episode of every season of that show and enjoyed it immensely. But there was one thing that we couldn't really wrap our heads around. They kept throwing cocktail parties and dinner parties, Nick, where all the guests couldn't stand each other. Like everybody who was antagonistic towards each other during the course of the show. And I mean, what good show worth its salt doesn't have a whole bunch of characters who are antagonistic towards each other, right? But they would invite all these characters to the same cocktail party. And then, of course, the fireworks would ensue. And eventually somebody would throw a drink in another person's face or something like that. And my wife and I ultimately just realized it was purely to drive dialogue. We're not expected to believe this is a rational guest list for any party that's supposed to end well. This was all to drive silly, fun dialogue. This was all in the name of the show's entertainment value. Mm. But if I'm throwing a cocktail party, Nick, shouldn't I kind of think a little bit outside my own social box and consider how well my guests are going to get along with each other? For example, I know these two guys and I know these two women, let's say. And personally, I get along with all of them. But I know two out of four of those people can't stand each other. If I know those people can't stand each other, shouldn't I tailor my guest list a little bit? Or are you all about just letting the fur fly? Which is it? I think for an early host, for somebody who doesn't have hosting experience. Now, you yourself, you're skilled in social dynamics and you can see sort of 4D chess. For the average person... Simply the more the merrier at their first parties. And I don't mean, like I said, not over 25 people, but I think the perfect number is 15 to 20. And so for somebody's first party, Scott, I had, I really advise people, you're just trying to fill the room with those that you feel comfortable with. You're not trying to curate your guest list yet. That's more of an advanced host move. Okay. So people you're comfortable with early on and let the chips fall where they may. My advice would be if somebody is perhaps trying to build a relationship or to impress a woman that they want to take out on a date, maybe don't invite her to this first party until you get the experience and you build the reps of what it takes to be a host. So for your first party, you want it to be a low stakes affair. And definitely don't invite her last two boyfriends. For sure. Ex-boyfriends, hopefully. All right, now, here's the question that I think is burning a hole in everybody's conscience right now. You said, I got to do something for two hours. You said, I have this thing planned down to the minute. I mean, icebreakers, Nick? I understand the idea of having name tags because then everybody gets a nice introduction to each other by way of knowing their name already. It's easier to make conversation when you can see someone's name, of course. Hey, I'm not too cool for that. I understand that most successful conferences give out name tags, so why shouldn't your party be any different? But icebreakers, Nick? I mean, what is this, youth group? What do you do? <laughs> what is this, youth group? I like that. Okay, look, here's what I want to say. As a host, your job at the party is to stir the pot. Your loyalty is not to a single guest but to the party as a whole. And when you do icebreakers, you probably know this because, again, you can see the advance, but I'm going to say for your listeners, have you ever been to a party and you get stuck talking to somebody for too long? The benefit of doing icebreakers is not only does it start new conversations, but it helps people to easily end their old conversations. And that's why you'll do three rounds of icebreakers at your two-hour cocktail party. Speaking of breaking the ice... Nick, how do you keep people from locking themselves in your bedroom on your bed and doing the wild thing together at your party? <laughs> you got to close. Just lock the bedroom? Wait, wait. I'm actually glad that you asked this. Because well, good. I'm glad you're glad I asked it. An easy pro tip is to put up some signs around your house, simple signs you can write on an index card or a sheet of paper that say, do not enter, private bedroom, here's the trash, this is the bathroom. Angry They're dog very ahead. Angry dog ahead, beware, welcome to my home, shoes off outside. Putting up some informational signs like that goes a long way to people seeing you as an organized professional host. Now, see, if it's winter time, you just collect everybody's coats and throw them on your bed. That's the oldest trick in the book. 
It works. It works. You're right. Yep. Okay. Give me an example of your kind of icebreaker. Oh, man. I'm afraid you're going to make fun of it, but I'm going to tell you why. It's- oh, no, no, no. Listen, I'm a lot more easygoing about this than I'm letting on. I mean, my personal favorite one, if you want me to be vulnerable first, is the two truths and one lie game. I love it. I'm a master at it. My two truths, actually, you could come up with five truths and one lie. That would be intimidating for most people, but I would rock your world with five truths and one lie. I've thought this through thoroughly. You would nail it. Um, so should I just keep going? Should I just kind of pick up at the question? Yeah, man. I was just going first because I wanted you to feel extra comfortable since this is my party and you're invited to it. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. My favorite icebreaker is to go around the room, say your name, say what you do for work, and then say one of your favorite things to eat for breakfast. It's pretty simple, but there's a science to why that icebreaker is really the best one to use at the beginning of your party. Well, if you live in San Antonio or Austin like us, and you don't say chorizo and egg tacos, there's something wrong with you. Everybody's going to have the same answer. Breakfast tacos. You're right. You're right. Well, it's got to be the chorizo ones. Chorizo potato tacos get a little greasy, but chorizo and egg, man, mm, that satisfies deeply. And any of y'all who don't know what I'm talking about, Google is your friend, C-H-O-R-I-Z-O and Egg Tacos. Oh, come get you some if you're not from around here the next time you're in South Texas. I'm getting hungry just thinking about that. I know, right? I'm doing the intermittent fasting thing, and I've got to stop doing these shows in the late afternoon. It's killing me, man. Anyway, I love that. But Nick, don't you think people would have been talking about who they are and what they do for a living already, though? It's a good point. It is an easy question, right? What do you do for work? Every guy think- always asks every other guy that right, first. Right. What do you do? It's like a pissing contest, right? It's a simple question, but I always encourage people to ask it among the whole room because you never know who may want to start a business, who may be looking for a new job, or who may be, you know, frankly, just kind of wanted to network a little bit. I do give people an out, though. Some people really hate that question. They don't want to talk about work, maybe because they're unemployed or they're embarrassed of their job. So I will say, if you don't want... Well, for them, breakfast was not the most important meal (laughs) of the day, clearly. (laughs) Um, So I will say, if you don't want to talk about your work, (laughs) then you can say a hobby that you have or a nonprofit that you support. If you don't want to talk about your work, give us the names and addresses and phone numbers of the last five women you slept with. That'll do instead. <laughs> How would your exes rate you? Yeah. Yes. What's your body count? Yeah. What's your body That would count? be a wonderful icebreaker. Now, I think about icebreakers as green, yellow, red, and a what's your body count or something like that would be what I call a red level icebreaker. It could be a great question but perhaps not at the beginning of the night when there's not a lot of rapport that's already built up. Kind of like playing Would You Rather at a cocktail party. (laughs) Man, that's a marriage ender sometimes. (laughs) I've literally been on that coaching call before with a guy who's worried his relationship's over because of what happened during a Cards Against Humanity game last night at a cocktail party. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah, it happens. They're killers. Well, I love it. I actually like the idea of doing icebreakers. I think it's brilliant, as long as, of course, they're not deal breakers, just like we gave several examples of. But no, that's good. You know, Nick, I think a lot of times adults need to figure out how to have fun again and stop being so darn gunfighter serious. And you know, a lot of your guy friends, maybe some of your casual acquaintances who end up at this party, maybe some of the plus ones that some of your friends bring, which is probably another good question. That's probably advanced level bringing a plus one, isn't it? But insofar as getting people out of their adult comfort zone, where they've forgotten to have fun, I mean, I think in the end, I suspect they're going to thank you for it. It'll be a lot more fun than it may appear on the surface, you know, especially when people really get to talking, you know, and that's right. Yeah. And that's the big thing. Nobody teaches adults how to make new friends. And as we get older, it's harder to make new friends. I don't have to tell you this. It's true. Yeah. A lot of guys are wondering aloud right now. Well, hey, this is this is assuming I have a social circle already. And Nick, you talk at length about how to build a social circle. How does the two-hour cocktail party philosophy kind of tie into building social circle at large? What are your thoughts on that? The general idea that I've found is that you're going to use these cocktail parties to almost audition the acquaintances in your life to become your friend. Think about it. No pressure. No pressure, right? Now, 
I don't say that to people. I don't tell them that. But think about it. If you meet a cool guy who you want to be friends with, what's the next move? Oftentimes, what, you're going to ask him for his phone number, ask him if he wants to hang out. It feels like a mandate or something. Yeah, you know, you bring up an interesting point because we actually did a show several years ago on how to make male friends. And one of the things that was discussed is I feel gay trying to make new friends. It seems like nowadays interaction between men, if it isn't ready made, like we're coworkers or are on the same softball team, if there's a guy you would just like to be friends with, it feels like you're potentially trying to be his gay lover. <laughs> I think it shouldn't have to be that way. It feels artificial to even think that way. It can be weird to make new friends with guys. You're like, hey, I kind of just want to hang out and be your buddy. Instead, what if you could invite him to a party and get to know somebody better and then hang out? I think making new friends is a great way to host a party to get to know somebody better. Or vice versa. Or Holding a party is a great way to make new friends. Exactly. It's an easy invite. If you're doing this once every two weeks, then it's a no-brainer. Hey, you seem pretty cool. You know, I hold a party every two weeks. You should drop by. It is an easy thing to say yes to. Think about the difference between can I get your number versus, hey, some friends and I are hosting a party. Can I send you the information? And nowadays, everybody's going to say, well, I'll try. I'll try to make it. <laughs> I'll try to make it. But when they see you being a professional host, when they see you sending invitations and reminder messages, you will show that you're a host who cares and you'll set yourself apart from everybody else. So is a professional host anything like a pimp? You know, I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> when you host a two-hour cocktail party, there is a checklist and there's a lot of stuff that you have to do to have a successful party. But through hosting hundreds of my own parties and teaching hundreds of other people to host their first party, I think I found a formula that works. So Nick, how should we go about being more outgoing? What if I'm not very good at that? Give me a couple of action steps. A great way to become a little more outgoing is, I mean, it sounds simple, like I'm beating the drum, but when you host a party at home, you will get the social skills of leading a group in a comfortable environment. When you're at home in your own space, speaking to your own friends, you'll practice leading and speaking to a crowd that you then have these skills when you're out at a bar, when you're out meeting other people, when you're at somebody else's party, you'll feel so much more confident. Hmm. What a brilliant concept. The best way to get myself out of my social comfort zone is to make that attempt, perhaps for the first time in a long time, in the larger context of my physical comfort zone still being. Yeah. There. Yeah. Wonderful. How meta of you. I love that idea. <laughs> I think you said it better than I did, but exactly what you said. Well, I mean, it makes perfect sense. If there's something that I'm kind of reticent to do because of social fear or it just doesn't feel comfortable to me, then afford myself whatever semblance of comfort I can. Kind of a sandbox, if you will, where that, I can try this, right? It's exactly that idea of hosting your first party with a low stakes affair, not trying to impress people yet, building up your skill set, getting the reps in, and then, you know, it really is a process. The people that are most successful with hosting, that build the biggest social networks, that have the best friends, network, relationships, and connections are those that make hosting a habit. And I think I figured out how to do that. Hosting is a habit. I really like that. Now, significantly, you thumbtacked the word yet behind trying to impress people. Now, that's a potentially controversial question. Should I be trying to impress people ever? Or should I just be myself, whatever that means? And I guess the context in which I'd love you to answer that particular question is relative to what I know you believe in, which is building your influence through effective networking. So obviously, if people aren't impressed with you, you're not going to be influencing anybody, right? So my educated guess here is that you're talking more about building respect and indeed building that influence rather than just bragging to people about your boat and your cars and your Harvard degree and having a captive audience rolling their eyes as you talk. Of course, right? Exactly right. I think about inviting people who you want to connect with to reaching up. It could be a woman that you want to create a relationship with. It could be a business leader that you want to do a deal with. It could be somebody that maybe you hopes to hire you at their company. We can invite those people into our world at a party but maybe not at the beginning. Wait until you've got the skill set and the confidence of hosting to know that you can run a good event. 
Yeah, build some expertise at this so you know you're not going to fumble the football at crunch time. Exactly. Fair enough. Well, I think all of this is fantastic. I'm actually a lot more excited, Nick, to throw a party in the very near future than I was when this episode started. And it's all because of you, Nick Gray. So, hey, hey, that's great. That's great. We could all use a new friend. Yeah, man. Hey, you're just a by 35. Come on down, man. We'll barbecue something. Although we're not supposed to have a whole lot of food, right? Well, we're probably going to break that particular rule when we're throwing our parties just because we're foodies around here. So, hey, if we have too much food, well, then people will just have to find a way to deal with it. But other than that, I'm man, coming to your party. I'm coming because I know you'll have barbecue. <laughs> For sure. His name is Nick Gray. He's from Austin, and he's the author of The Two-Hour Cocktail Party, How to Build Big Relationships with Small Gatherings. And I'll tell you what, gentlemen, you've gotten a huge insight into what Nick's all about. So what I want you to do is grab a copy of his book so you can get the rest of those insights right on. It's all there for you at the top of my Amazon influencer queue right now, which you can reach by going to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon. And also you absolutely need to check out Nick Gray's website, which you can reach by heading to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash party P A R T Y. What are they going to find when they get there, Nick? When you go to my website, I have uh, an executive summary of my book and a party checklist that they can download to tell them the 17 things they can do right now before your next party to help make it a success. Well, hey, that makes it a no brainer. You made it easy. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? All right. Well, that sounds absolutely terrific, Nick. This has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, Certainly a lot of fun. And I would expect nothing different from a guy who holds parties all the time. So thanks for joining us, man, and we hope you'll come back soon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. And gentlemen, be sure to also head over to mountaintoppodcast.com, where you can find out what's up with our three main sponsors, Origin in Maine, Hero Soap, and Keyport. You can click on links to each of our sponsors at mountaintoppodcast.com. And when you partake of any of their fine goods, please use the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 to get an additional 10% off. Now, Nick Gray has the book on how to throw a party in your own home. I have a book called Sticking Point Solved, which you can get for absolutely free simply by getting on my daily newsletter list. Now, when you download your copy of that book, you're going to find chapters that cover just about any potential problem, quandary, or scenario you may find yourself in with a woman. That's there for you free of charge at mountaintoppodcast.com. And also, of course, if you're still on the fence about talking to me free for 25 minutes, go ahead and click that red button right at the top of the page at mountaintoppodcast.com. And hey, man, let's get acquainted. Let's talk about where you are right now in terms of your success with women and what's going to supercharge it. What's going to up-level it to the place where you have the right woman in your life once and for all. All of that and so much more is there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.